Welcome to episode 3 on our series from chapter 12a. And in this final episode, we're going to talk about the structure of the DNA double helix and we're going to go over the structure of a chromosome. Some of the basics for that one kind of set you up for a future chapter. But first I want to talk about the, the two groups of scientists who really honed in on the double helix structure of the DNA. And it starts with this woman. A woman in the early 1950s, her name was Rosalind Franklin, and she's doing her work in England. And she's working on a technique that's called X-ray diffraction. Now, what Rosalind would do is she would take X-rays and shoot them in to, say, a beaker full of some certain kind of biomolecule. And when she was working with DNA, I've got a prop here to show you, she basically got lucky on one or two of her shoots. And if you see here in this model of DNA, the X-ray went straight down through it. And so if you look at this picture on the lower left or on the left side of your screen, you can see, see how it crisscrosses and forms an X shape? And you can see that there's a dark band on the top and there's a darker band on the bottom. And then you can see some light ones to the left and the right. This picture pretty much was the aha moment for another group of scientists to figure out that, oh, DNA looks like a twisted ladder. It's a double helix, okay? So I cannot stress to you enough how important the work of Miss Franklin was in this discovery of the DNA molecule. Now, remember we talked about in Chapter 1 about peer review? Another group of scientists who was working on this, they actually saw a lab report written by uh, Miss Franklin. And these two gentlemen were Watson and Crick. All right? James Watson was an American. Um, He's basically from the Midwest. He did his undergraduate work at Indiana University. Uh, that's this gentleman here on the left. And then the guy on the right is a British scientist, uh, Francis Crick. Okay. Uh, if memory serves me right, I think Mr. Crick has recently passed away, but Mr. Watson is still alive. Yeah. Um, they used Franklin's work to come up with their three-dimensional model. And in fact, this is a picture of the model that they created in 1953. Okay. Double helix. Now, I want you to remember, double helix means, in plain English, twisted ladder. And the double part refers to two strands. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Okay, two strands. Okay. The helix has a sugar and phosphate backbone. Basically, if you draw a ladder like this, the sugar and phosphate backbone is right there. And the bases are in the middle. And the steps of a ladder are called rungs. So the rungs of the ladder are the nitrogenous bases. I'm going to draw right down in here. So the bases would be here in the middle. And these bases are held together by hydrogen bonds. Now these hydrogen bonds are real important. It's strong enough to hold the ladder together, but it's not too strong that you can't unzip it pretty easily. The DNA has to be able to be held together, but it needs to be able to be unzipped when you want to do replication or when you want to make proteins because you have to read some of the DNA. Okay, we're going to cover those two concepts in some upcoming podcasts. All right, let's get rid of that stuff, move on to the next slide. As you see on this slide, we have a detailed structure of the double helix. And the first thing I want to do is I want to draw a nucleotide. Or actually, I'm going to circle this one. Now, a nucleotide has three parts. It has a phosphate group right there. It has a sugar, and in this case, the sugar is deoxyribose because it's DNA. And then it has a nitrogenous base. I'm going to put a B here for a base. And in this case, the base is thymine. Now, because it only has one ring, if you remember from the previous episode, this is called a pyrimidine. You have a single pyramid. Okay. Over here, you know, you follow Chargoff's rules. A pairs with T. So here's adenine. Adenine is a double ring. So it's a purine. Once again, that's from it, from the previous episode. And you'll notice you see these little dots right in here. These dots represent hydrogen bonds. 
So one, two, three. Let me draw this a little smaller. One, two, three. One. Oops, here we go. I guess there's none there, right there. Uh, one, two, three, one, two, three. Those are the dots, okay? The backbone is this area right along here. And you'll notice that it's alternating sugars. And in this case, remember that's deoxyribose. Put a D in there. And then we have phosphate groups. And there's a P. So the sides of the ladder, if we draw it over here, it'll look like this. Just like what we drew on the previous one. Okay, you've got sugars and phosphates right there. So sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. Sugars and phosphate backbone. The steps of the ladder, those are what we call base pairs. And these base pairs follow Chargoff's rules, A to T, C to G. Okay. Now, one other thing I want you to notice here, you see these numbers, 3 prime and 5 prime? I'm going to keep it really, really easy for you to remember. Um, these guys are what we call, or I'm sorry, the, the strands of DNA, the backbones, they're anti-parallel. Think of like a two-way street. Somebody's going south, somebody's going north. Okay, I'm going to write this word down here for you. It's anti-parallel. I knew I was going to misspell that. Let's try that again. Anti-parallel. Okay, and what that means is if it's 5 prime... On this side, it's 3 prime, whoops, 3 prime over here. If it's 5 prime at that end, the opposite end is 3 prime. If it's 3 prime there, it's going to be 5 prime. When we learn about uh, replication, we're going to learn that a certain enzyme goes from a 5 prime to a 3 prime direction. And so basically what's happening is one strand goes this way, Another strand goes that way, anti-parallel. All right, so we're going to keep this real simple. Five prime, that equals the phosphate end. See how this phosphate's sticking out down here? And then the three prime is the sugar end. I don't have a fancy way to remember that three prime is sugar. You just need to remember that the backbone is made out of sugars and phosphate. Sugars and phosphate. So if one end is a phosphate, the other end has to be a sugar because it's not made out of anything else. Okay? So maybe you can think of you need three sugars in a cup of coffee or something like that. All right? So five prime is the phosphate end. Just think of the F sound. And three prime is the sugar. Okay? And remember, hydrogen bonds hold this together. They're strong enough to hold it up together, but if you need to unzip it, they're pretty easily broken. Okay? All right, let's wipe that away. This is a real important one. Uh, make sure that you study this one right there. This is an important, important slide, so make sure you study it. All right. DNA is kept in chromosomes inside the nucleus of eukaryotic cells. Now, you need to know what eukaryotic means. Okay? The prefix U means true. And true cells have a nucleus. Like, like your cells. You have a nucleus, so you have true cells. Another great way to remember, see this U, E, U in nucleus? E, U and eukaryotic. Right? So our DNA is packed into chromosomes. Uh, chromosomes are basically snippets of DNA that are easier to carry around. And we learn about mitosis, which is cell division. Uh, we're going to learn that it's, it's important to have it in smaller parts so we can move the chromosomes around. So here you have your DNA double helix. And let's say this. If this is an adenine, then that has to be a thymine. And if this is a guanine, then that has to be a cytosine. A to T, C to G. Always together, good couple. 
Now this DNA double helix is relatively fragile, so we need to protect it. So we're going to wrap it around some proteins to kind of make it have a little bit of protection. And these proteins are called histones. So write yourself a little note that these are proteins. Now eight proteins are going to cling together to form a little bead. So if you look here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then there's a fourth one back in behind here. Now two loops of DNA are going to wrap around eight histone molecules, and that's going to form a structure called a nucleosome. Oftentimes you're going to read that nucleosomes are described as beads on a string. You get caught up there. There we go. Okay. And you want to remember that it's eight histones, HIS for histones, and two DNA loops. So you see here, right? Here's a nucleosome. One, two, three. There's a fourth one hidden behind here. Five, six, seven, eight histones. One loop, two loops. That's one nucleosome. Okay. The nucleosomes are coiled up into what are creatively called a coil. The coils are then coiled up again, and those are called supercoils. And then the supercoils are going to compact into what we call a chromosome. And in fact, because you have one side of the X and another side of the X, this is actually called a replicated chromosome. Now, each side of the X has a special name, and they are called chromatids. Chromatid. Chromatids. Right. Now, it gets a little confusing at this because we have the words chromosomes, chromatid, and now we have a third word, and it's called chromatin. See that word IN? That refers to protein. Chromatin is basically DNA and the proteins that it's wrapped around. So chromatin can be coiled up into chromatids, and two chromatids come together to create a chromosome. It is ridiculously confusing because they're all the same thing. Chromatin, chromatids, chromosomes. They're the exact same thing. They just get a different name at different times in the cycle. So you just, you just need to keep practicing these to, to be able to tell the difference between a chromatid, chromatin, and a chromosome. But I'll give it to you one more time. Chromatin is DNA wrapped around uh, protein. Chromosome is condensed chromatin. And a chromatid is one half of the X. Okay? Okay, we're going to stop right there. This is going to end our series from Chapter 12a on DNA structure and uh, the structure of chromosomes and how DNA was discovered. In other words, what was the role of all these scientists? Uh, chapter 12b will consist of a single episode on DNA replication. In other words, how does this double helix split apart to make a copy so we can pass a copy of our genes on to the next generation? Okay, until then, we'll catch you on the next series of episodes.